Okay, welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. This is the March 2020 HMIS user meeting. Let me share my screen. Um, welcome. If you haven't already, please enter your agency name into the chat box so we know who's participating. Um, and we're going to jump right in. So our agenda, we're going to review or we're going to give you an update on the system performance measures report and see where you can um, review it yourself. We are going to give you an update on the 2020 HIC and sheltered pit. Uh, we want to get your feedback on the HMIS cheat sheets that we released last month. Um, give you an update on the coordinated entry data standards training. Um, go over the housing move-in date guidance because that has been a question by some of our users frequent or recently. Um, we also have a new field for clients that are exiting permanent housing projects without a housing move-in date. Um, and we have the data and performance management meeting agenda. We're going to go ahead and get started. First up, the system performance measures report has been submitted to HUD. It was submitted last Friday. And um, the report has been published on our website, so I'll show you how you can review that. Thank you to all the agencies that participated and um, reviewed the corrections that we sent and made it as many corrections as they could to make, our, make sure our data was the best it could be. Um, so on our website, when we, when we publish these slides, you'll, um, there'll be a link, but what it will look like, uh, this is the page on our website. There's a system performance reports page. The top gives you an overview of, of what it is and um, the measures that are included. And then at the bottom, there are links to all of the reports that we have submitted for the fa past five years. Um, and the 1819 report is the report that we just submitted. And so if you click on the link, you will see. So this is. Um, this is a custom report that uh, 211 created, but it includes all of the data that was submitted to HUD in the system performance report. Um, so the first page is just an overview of what it is and the measures and what's included in the report, um, as well as what our bed participation looks like for the different housing project types in HMIS. So this is the percentage of beds in Orange County that are not DV beds. Um, and are in HMIS. So you can see that there. And then throughout the report, you will see these orange and teal boxes. The orange boxes um, will let you know how we are doing in comparison with the rest of the country and, and California. Um, so you can see how we compare. And then the teal box um, highlights any um, nuances or data quality issues that are specific to Orange County that kind of explains how the data looks. Um, and then the rest of the report is broken down by measure, as you can see, and the top includes an overview of what that measure is. And then on the side, it'll tell you which project types are included. Um, and you can see over year, over, year over year how we're doing on these different measures. Um, oh, and at the top of each page, it'll also tell you um, if we're trying to decrease whatever the numbers are or increase them so you get a little more context. And so um, feel free to look through this, this report um, and see how we're doing as a COC. It's just something we put together to kind of make it easy to compare how we're doing year over year. Um, any questions about this report? Um, I'm seeing none, but if you think of something, definitely put it in the chat box and we can come back to it. Um, and I'm going to move on to the next item. Uh, Adriana? Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me good? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay, so th thank you everybody who participated in the Hagen Shelter Pit this year. 
We really appreciate your hard work and all the time that you have put into this process. All the HMIS participating agencies have submitted their HIC and PIC data. However, though, we are still working with some agencies on the reviewing process. So if you still have trouble with the corrections that we have sent you, we can schedule in-person revision sessions so we can help you completing those corrections. So if you're interested, please let us know so we can schedule a time that works for you and your reviewer. And also, please keep in mind that we are in the final stage of the review process, so it is important to finalize this stage pretty soon. And in this regard, we also appreciate your speedy responses. So again, let us know, please, if you're interested in meeting with us, and thank you so much for your ongoing hard work and the collaboration through this process. Do you guys have any questions in this regard? I'm not seeing anything. Okay, thank you. Okay. Next up, we're looking for some feedback on the HMIS data elements cheat sheet. Um, Myra? Hello? Hello? Yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. So it's been about a month since we published the HMIS data cheat sheets, um, and we wanted to ask everyone for some feedback. I know I mentioned in the last user meeting that we were going to be working on another guide that would focus more on reporting and another one that would be um, specific to CES data elements. So while I create those, I wanted to see if there was any improvements that we could make on the existing guides, as well as suggestions I can keep in mind while making the other ones in the next coming weeks. Um, so I did write out a couple questions to just ask the group so that we can kind of gauge um, how everyone feels about them. Uh, with first and foremost, if anyone has been able to look at them, um, did, has anyone shared them with their team? Has there been any feedback that was given uh, to you or any feedback you would like to provide? Um, do you guys find it helpful? Are there any ways in which we can make improvements to what they are? Oh, and I see there's some feedback. Um, I sent them out to the agency and a lot of folks were happy to receive them. Awesome, thank you, Cassie. If there's anything um, that's not clear on the guides or you think that there's something missing, we can definitely add that, so take a minute and think about it. Um, more feedback, we've used them for the training, or we've used them for training our new, our new users, super helpful. Thanks for creating these, Myra. Thank you, Isis. And if anything doesn't come to mind right away, um, feel free to just like submit a ticket or something. I would definitely be open to just getting any kind of improvements onto these or the new ones that we create. But um, so just to, um, I guess kind of give a preview, we're also planning to make a cheat sheet for coordinated entry and um, We've gotten feedback in the past about um, more guidance around how data elements are contributing to performance measures. So we're trying to create a guide that kind of gives some information around that. So you can expect those um, in the coming months. And got some excitement for a CES one. Yes. Um, so if you think of anything else that isn't covered by either of those two things or isn't in the current cheat sheets, um, definitely let us know and we can do that too. Excited for CES for both access points and housing providers, cool. Hi. Um, so yeah, just continue to use them. Um, do you want to move on to the next slide? Um, yes, so if anybody thinks of anything, definitely add it or um, put in a ticket and we can um, update the cheat sheet. Um, okay, so this is me again. <laughs> 
so this tick, uh, this slide's mostly for agencies or only for agencies that are currently participating in family coordinated entry um, as an access point or a housing provider. So the CES training has been out since February 14th. Uh, the training's covering the new data collection requirements for the coordinated entry system that is outlined in the 2020 HUD data standards manual. Um, there are only three new CES data elements, so the training is relatively short. We expect that it should take users about 20 to 10, uh, 10 to 20 uh, minutes to complete. We have begin, began removing uh, CES access from users that had CES access previously. So uh, make sure that users are checking up on that because it isn't like extremely obvious or upfront. So that began on March 2nd. Uh, so if they had CES access before and they had not cre uh, completed the training as of March 2nd, they are no longer able to access CES. Uh, so as a reminder, if you did have uh, CES access as of February 14th, you are to take the 2020 CES data standards training. Any users that had or wanted to get CES access after February 14th need to complete the HMIS coordinated entry training. And the, the reason the training is different is because the 2020 coordinated entry data standards lessons have been added into the HMIS coordinated entry training so that new users only need to complete the one training. They don't need to do both. And also one last thing, um, agency administrators uh, do need to submit the ticket to HMIS through the help desk to notify us. Um, once users have completed their training so we can unlock or add their accounts back to CES access since we don't get notifications right away when users complete their training. So as a reminder. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, hey, everyone. So we're going to go over the housing move-in date data element before we talk about a new field that has been added to HMIS for PSH, OPH, and rapid rehousing projects. Um, the purpose of that new field is to record a reason for a missing housing move-in date when a client exits one of those project types without a housing move-in date recorded to kind of see what happened during the enrollment. Um, so everything that I'm going to talk about for this slide is in our knowledge base article on housing move-in date, so make sure to check that out later if you need to. Um, housing move-in date is an important data element used to analyze data in the point in time count, uh, the HIC, um, as well as project performance reports for PSH, OPH, and rapid rehousing projects. Um, this data element differentiates clients who are enrolled in PSH, OPH, or rapid rehousing who have been placed in permanent housing from those who are in those project types but who have not been placed in housing yet. Um, for all project types, housing move-in date should be entered on the head of household project enrollment screen when that client or household moves into a permanent housing unit. So in most cases, housing move-in date will not match project start date. Um, project start date for PSH, OPH, and rapid rehousing projects records the date the client was determined eligible for housing placement and agreed to receive services. And housing move-in date is the date that the client physically moved into their permanent housing unit. So for more information about project start date and when that date should be determined, you can check out our project start date knowledge base article, which goes over how each project type should be determining project start date. Okay, so there are some special circumstances that the HMIS data manual um, provides guidance on regarding housing move-in date, so I'm gonna go over those too. For rapid rehousing projects, housing move-in date should be recorded whether the rapid rehousing project is funding the unit the client ultimately moves into or not. So if a client moves into a unit the project has not paid for or provided rental assistance for, housing move-in date should still be entered into HMIS because it still def differentiates clients who have been housed from those who have not. 
um, clients enrolled in PSH or OPH who are receiving pre-housing placement services but are ultimately housed by another project or subsidy source should be exited from that PH project to the appropriate destination based on the client's living situation at the time of project exit. And if the client exits the permanent housing project for a different housing opportunity without first having physically moved into a housing unit associated with the project, you do not need to enter a housing move-in date. You can just exit the client and record the exit destination. Just looking for questions, okay. Um, in the event that a client vacates a housing situation and the project stops paying rental assistance, staff should exit the client from the project with an accurate project exit date and a destination that reflects the client's new, new living situation, and then create a new project start date and a second enrollment for the client on the same or following day. So this is where um, the ongoing services will be recorded that are provided until the client moves into another unit at which time a new housing move-in date would be recorded on the second project enrollment. If a client moves directly from one unit into another unit with no days of homelessness in between, it's not necessary to exit and re-enter the client because their housing move-in date would still accurately reflect the day they entered permanent housing um, and there were no breaks really in that permanent housing. And the last special circumstance is in the event that a client is transferred into a PSH or rapid rehousing project having already moved into a permanent housing unit, the client's project start date and housing move-in date will be the same date. It is not necessary or appropriate to have the housing move-in date reflect the original move-in in the new enrollment since the purpose of the data element is just to distinguish between clients who have been housed and clients who have not been housed during a single enrollment. All right, are there any questions about housing move-in date before we talk about the new data element? Or the new field, sorry, it's not a new data element. I'm not seeing any questions. Okay, we can go to the next slide then. So at the January 2020 Data and Performance Management Committee meeting, it was decided that it would be beneficial to start keeping track of reasons that households may exit PSH, OPH, or rapid rehousing projects without housing move-in date. So this new field, which you can see a screenshot of, will appear um, if the client exits one of those project types without a housing move-in date. And the available response options are the client was unable to meet landlord requirements, the client transferred to another project, their certificate expired, the project lost contact with the household, the client's needs could not be met by the project, or the client was housed outside of the project, or data not collected. And ideally, data not collected would only be used in the case of an enrollment being reopened after the client has exited, in which case the HMIS user wouldn't be able to collect information on why a housing movement date wasn't entered. We're and also wondering today. We're also Sorry. wondering um, if an optional text box okay would be useful here to provide more detail, like in cases of the project not being able to meet the client's needs or the client being unable to meet landlord requirements, like being able to provide more context for that. So if that's something you think would be helpful or especially not helpful, um, let us know. And it doesn't look like there's any questions. So I guess we all understand housing movement date perfectly now. It's pretty cool. Um, would certificate expired be the same as funds not available? Um, I, that would be a good question for the rapid rehousing providers. I think we uh, certificate expired was meant for um, the PSH voucher projects. Um, I don't know if the rapid rehousing providers feel like a separate um, option is necessary or if certificate expired is okay for or means the same thing to them as funds not available.
these um, these answer options were originally discussed during the data meeting. Um, so it, it's possible that more items need to be added, but so that would be a good um, question for all, everybody here. Uh, will this be on the HMIS exit forms or just in the Clarity exit screen? Um, we can add it to the, the HMIS exit forms. Are there any rapid rehousing providers that think that uh, funds not available is is needed to be added to this list, or does certificate expired kind of meet your need? Uh, I got one vote for adding funds not available. All right, we're adding it. <laughs> um, two votes for adding it. All right, yeah, we can add that. Um, the field, like I said, should be available today. Um, the exit form it may take a couple days, um, but we should be able to have them published by the time the, the minutes for this meeting go out so that we can include those that link in those um, minutes. Um, all right. Linda. Hi, so this is just a little overview of what we will be discussing on this upcoming data and performance meeting. Um, so the homeless prevention um, project performance report will be published and um, we will be going over that and discussing the details of the report. Um, also, we will be discussing um, about further plans to move forward with the data accuracy dashboard. Um, just a quick reminder that this month's data meeting will be held on um, March 12th, Thursday, upstairs in the CASA training room um, from 1.30 to 3. Um, and we hope to see you all there. And just to give um, everyone an update that was at the last data meeting, um, there was some talk about whether or not we were going to continue to have the data meeting. Um, and we are going to continue having the data meeting. So um, the COC board did decide to make it not, um, to no longer have it be a subcommittee, but we're going to continue to meet um, and manage all of the um, email notifications and everything. So we'll send out the agenda prior to the meeting. We'll start posting the minutes from these meetings on our website, as well as the slides and everything. Um, but the meeting will still happen and we can talk about it a little more um, on the 12th. All right, so we have made it through our scheduled agenda, so we do have time for some Q&A. If anybody has anything they want to ask us or anything they would like to see um, in HMIS, any questions? demos or anything, we can do that now. Um, otherwise, we will close down the meeting, but I'll wait a couple minutes. Uh, let's see. For the supplemental non-permanent exit questions, would needs not met by project apply to participant non-compliance in program situations? Um, it might be a good idea to have um, non-compliance be a separate option so that um, there's more context um, because it could be that the client's needs weren't met because of something else. 
but non-compliance um, is is more, I guess, behavioral. Um, so we could add that if you feel like that is something you would like to be able to track. And we can also um, revisit this. So we're going to, when once it's um, published and available and we have these answer options, we can always come back and discuss and see if these answer options make sense or if some need to be added or removed. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in. I got another vote for program noncompliance. Um, so we'll go ahead and add that. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in. If you haven't already, please add your agency name to the chat box so we know who um, participated in the meeting. Uh, like I said earlier, we will be publishing the slides, the meeting minutes, and this, uh, the recording of this webinar on our website, and we will email that out um, within the next few days. Um, and our next meeting is scheduled for April 1st, so we'll send out that meeting reminder also. Um, otherwise, thanks everybody for attending, and we will talk to you next month.